Hello, I'm glad you could join us today. Welcome to the webinar, Revenue Cycle Management De Demystified. My name is Angie Fiedler Sutton, and I'm with the Behavioral Health Association of Providers. The Behavioral Health Association of Providers, otherwise known as BHAP, is a national trade membership association that provides education and advocacy for behavioral health care providers and related entities. Formerly known as the American Addiction Treatment Association, BHAP is the leading and unifying voice of addiction-focused treatment programs. We provide membership benefits, such as networking and access to compliance information, educational opportunities, such as this webinar and our Certificate in Addiction Treatment Marketing, the CATM, and advocacy efforts to keep those in the industry aware of new laws and regulations that may be coming that will affect them. Working in the behavioral health industry or managing an organization in the industry can be incredibly complex and filled with ever-changing information. BHAP gives you resources to stay on top of the rules and regulations for your organization to stay compliant. For more information about BHAP, you can visit our website at www.bhap.us. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Peter Wallstrom is a seasoned healthcare executive in the behavioral healthcare sector. Mr. Wallstrom's background includes eight years of, as chief financial officer for a mid-sized treatment group, followed by two years as executive vice president for an industry-leading healthcare software company. He also founded an independent medical billing company, which he grew over four years until finally divesting it to, to a strategic partner. Since 2019, Mr. Wallstrom has served as an independent healthcare consultant specializing in revenue cycle management. Peter, thank you for taking the time to present today. With that, I'll hand the webinar over to you. Hey, thank you so much, Angie, and thank you, BHAP. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, showing up and, and tuning in. Um, when we originally started talking about, um, you know, what I would present um, with BHAP, there's just some things that I've, from, from being in this industry for such a long time and being on several different sides of the, the, uh, the revenue cycle process, you know, having been beholden to it as a facility owner, knowing nothing about it, just starting out, trying to, to get my hands around it as I start to learn more and more, um, having outsourced billing company, then bringing billing in house, um, then building that billing company, selling the billing company, uh, working in software, dealing with the systems that manage the revenue cycle management that empower, you know, uh, good transfer of data, storage of data, reporting, uh, and, and good business intelligence to, to make sound decisions. Um, I, I ended up with, with what I thought would be of value to people without getting too far in the weeds, which is covering a couple basic concepts that I find get either undervalued, misunderstood, um, or just gotten plain wrong. Um, so where I wanna start is a little bit of a story about what, what I went through. Um, I, we had a facility, this is in 2012. Um, I was doing the finances. I started tracking, you know, little bits of data, the, the best I knew how uh, in an Excel spreadsheet. And I started to notice that the reports that I got from my billing company weren't matching up with what I thought should be out there in AR or in collections. Uh, I, I essentially stopped having enough confidence in what I was seeing. Um, the unfortunate part was by the time I actually knew well enough that something was going on, the, the trends were so far apart, the, the disparity was so large because I, I had so little, such a, little, a lacking of information. Uh, I just wasn't very sharp. I didn't know what I was looking for. So the disparity had to get pretty big for me to realize that there was a serious problem. Um, so by then we're, we're really scrambling. Um, we pulled away from the billing company overnight. Um, there was massive millions of dollars of AR that were, they were being written off uh, without our, our authorization so that it made the AR look like it wasn't as bad as it was. There, there was all sorts of things going on. Um, and essentially I hired three billers uh, the best I could, again, without really knowing how to evaluate billers, um, brought them in house and we just went to work learning as much as I could about RCM as, as humanly possible, as quickly as possible. Um, as far as the way to do it, the worst way possible, you know, just jumping directly into it uh, with very little wherewithal, um, just trying to, to figure out your, your own finances. But um, what we did accomplish over the next uh, about 18 months 
is we were able to, to collect, and we were not a huge facility. Um, we were in business for quite some time, was able to collect over $1.3 million in cash collections that was over 300 days old at the time of collection over the next 18 months. Uh, we were able to successfully litigate against the, uh, the our billing company and you know reach a, a settlement with them over some of the malfeasance that had gone. And we were able to grow a successful medical billing company kind of out of this, this, this necessity. Um, the reason I share all that is because when during my time at the software company and during my time since in consulting, I talked to tons of people that call with all sorts of questions and issues, and they usually don't know exactly what their problem is yet, but they know what they don't like that they're seeing. Uh, collections aren't what they well, want them to be. They're not what they used to be. The bank account's going down instead of up. Um, you know, they're, they would like to take on a strategic partner or, um, you know, equity partner or debt partner, and they keep hearing no. Um, they don't know how to evaluate the quality of their earnings uh, and how to, how to represent them. And what they, what they end up, what I end up understanding as I talk to them more and more is, you know, there's, there's certain things that they took for granted or they assumed as time went on were working or they assumed were going to continue to work because they didn't know what to look for. They didn't have the base skill set to evaluate their billing company, to evaluate their, you know, internal billing department. Um, so, and I, I know it's, it's gotten difficult as time has gone on and there's been a lot of billing companies that haven't done a great job. Or there's been a lot of, of times where companies have seen their collections go down and down and down and they blame their billing company and now they're on their third billing company. They just don't know what to do. So where I want to start is uh, a basic understanding of the third party payer system that we're in. The third party payer system referring to you have a, a patient who's receiving services, you have charges for those services being paid by a a payer or an insurer of some sort, whether it's a government agency or a commercial agency like Aetna, Cigna, and then you have the provider actually providing those services. The, that, those three legs creates a very complicated um, and potentially very, uh, a, a system that, that can be very fraught with, with fraud, with uh, waste, and with, with rising costs and a lack of transparency. Uh, it's the, the base of that system, the, the fundamental architecture of that system, how it's set up, not saying whether it's good or bad or whether I agree with it or disagree with it, but it does provide the, the raw clay for a lot of issues. Um, one of the biggest issues is it, it allows, just like for, for car insurance, for example, there's, there's a mechanism called member responsibility, deductible, coinsurance. Um, those items are meant to have the individual who actually consumes services to have a direct uh, financial burden of, cons of using those services. Because if they didn't, it would drive a lot of very, very uh, irresponsible behavior. Just like if you could go to any car uh, auto shop in the world and you could just give them your insurance card and you didn't have a deductible and your premiums wouldn't go up, you paid the same you know, $500 a month or whatever you pay, you wouldn't drive as responsibly. You might take those corners a little tighter. You wouldn't think as much about, shoot, if something happens to my car, I'm also going to have this direct cost immediately. And that's something that really happened in our industry. Um, that that mechanism that's supposed to keep the third party payer system more responsible, more accountable, uh, it broke down and facilities began waiving those fees so that patients could go into a facility and if, whether it was $500 or a $5,000 deductible, uh, they weren't being collected at all. And that became um, pretty much uh, a standard practice in the industry. Unfortunately, you know, what that led to was you know, patients just going in and out of facilities over and over and the recidivism became really, really high. Um, uh, another big, big issue with it was we weren't tracking 
the efficacy of, of the services provided. There wasn't a unified standard of outcomes. So in this uh, kind of where I'm to bring it all together, you have this, this murky system, this, these three parties, one paying for the other, who's not responsible for the services, you know, who's not responsible for the payment, who's not responsible for actually proceeding, mixed with the lack of direct accountability, the, the lack of direct economic impact, and we're not measuring efficacy of whether or not these services even work. So when you go into trying to look at, you know, what revenue cycle management looks like and how to understand it, you have to understand that that's the foundation, you're, you're, that's the, the, the environment that you're in. Nothing is going to be a straight answer. Nothing is going to be super simple or, or super easy because there's so many different forces that are working so inefficiently uh, and, and a lot are, are very much opposed to each other. So when we take the, the uh, viewpoint of a facility that says, you know, my reimbursements are going down, I'm not getting paid for services, you know, damn these insurance companies, they're so evil. Yeah, I see, I hear your point, but if you look at it from their perspective, it's hard to argue that, that the industry has given them uh, a very good reason to pay a ton of money for services when we're not proving uh, outcomes, when we're not um, being able to show a, a, a decrease in recidivism and, and return rates to facilities. Um, when facilities are blatantly not collecting, can't show any evidence of collecting much of the, the member responsibility that, that they're supposed to. So it, it's a very difficult thing to expect a lot of clarity from. Um, so wh where I would uh, go with that as far as a takeaway is when anybody, I get a lot of questions that are, are direct questions that, that they seem to want a very clear answer. And it'll be, uh, you know, how much am I going to get paid for PHP in Arizona uh, for out of network? Or how much should I get contracted for in network in this state or, or something like that? Or should this be happening? Yes or no. It's all relative to your business model. It's all re relative to whether you are, your, your relationships with these payers, how long you've been in business, uh, how well your patients do after treatment at not uh, recycling back into other facilities. Um, if the payers are seeing uh, a, a lowered amount of ER visits and, and other claim activity from the patients that go through you after they're done with treatment with you, um, all those are, are factors so that it's, it's when evaluating your own decisions and the things that you want to, to decide or the things that you want to know, some sort of, of data point you're trying to, to, um, to, to ascertain, it's, it's a very complicated question and it requires someone to really get to know these underlying factors and really take into consideration your own business before trying to just get some magical number. What it also empowers you to do is knowing that, knowing how those things are all interrelated, is it allows you to know and, and it empowers you to have areas where you can actually go to to increase whatever it is you're looking for. So if you say, I want uh, in-network rates with Aetna, well, understanding these, these concepts that I'm talking about informs you at what things you need to do to be able to go to Aetna how they think about you, how they look at you, so that when you finally go to them, you're not just saying, hey, we want this rate because we heard that you gave so-and-so. You know that you have to prove that you're providing a good value to their, to their uh, members. You need to have a good method of tracking outcomes. You have to be able to show uh, the, the uh, accreditation for, on your facility. The, you, know, you know the things that they, they care about because you know, you know all the complications they have at trying to figure out what in the world they should pay you or if at all. Um, so I don't know if, if there's any questions so far. I'll move on to the second. Um, asked what type of facility did you okay. have and could you tell us what you learned? How could I start a homeless shelter in Los Angeles County that has comprehensive services which include substance abuse treatment? That probably is a bit big of an ask, but maybe you can touch on it. Yeah. Yeah, I had, um, so I, I had a facility that was out of network. Um, this is back in 2009. 
it was uh, started out as IOP, then we added PHP, uh, eventually went into residential and detox. Um, but in 2012, we, uh, my partner and I purchased an in-network facility, small residential um, in-network facility for the contracts. It had 32 in-network contracts. So we were seeking to um, access the HMO network. Um, so they, they already had the, it was 23 years old, the facility at the time. Um, what I learned, man, um, I, I learned an awful lot, but one of the biggest things that I learned through the, the facilities, um, uh, was I, I took too much time at a lot, during a lot of things there were there, it was to be more, much more demanding and much more proactive, um, and, and not try to do so much at once. Um, there's so many things that I look back on that we had identified as a trend or as a risk um, or as, as a market shift that we were trying to do so much at the time, you know, where we could have focused in on one or two trends or things that we had noticed uh, and executed much more quickly uh, and not tried to do everything completely, you know, to the, to the nines, you know, everything just perfect. And, and focus more on the expedience with which we, we, uh, we address market trends, um, we, we would have been able to actually capture a lot more than we did. I think we, we saw a lot of things, you know, just wash right by us, but we had seen them coming, you know, it, it was very frustrating. Um, okay, and then, um, she, uh, Norma also asked, could you mention the three systems again? The, sure. Yeah. The, the, the third party payer system refers to uh, the, the three parties would be one is the person receiving or consuming services. So that's going to be your patient. And two would be the provider of those services. So the patient pays a fixed amount every month to a, an insurer or a payer. The payer is, you know, Aetna, Cigna, uh, Medicaid, whoever it is. The patient pays them a certain amount every month. Then they consume services that are provided by a provider. The provider pays the costs to provide those services and gets paid by the payer in lump or in piece but for those services. But usually the, the, the provider and the patient, like at a dentist's office, you might have a copay but it's 30 bucks and then they bill the rest to the insurance. And that's that member responsibility part. The, what's supposed to be a, a hindrance and over usage, uh, a, a direct impact to use services. So you're, you're sharing in that, that immediate cost of the services you use as you go. Okay. And then Monique just wanted to say that so true, this affected so many providers. Patients also became educated patients and worked theirs out of network benefits to their advantage because checks are made to them. Collections had to be yeah. on top of all of counts. Yeah, that happened too. There, there's, there's so many things that happened that um, the, the insurance companies did to, to accomplish a number of different things. And one of them is, as out of network charges were, were just super high and the out of network facilities were popping up everywhere, the payers were attempting to have the, to steer the patient in network. Uh, and so what they ended up doing is they wanted the facility to say no, if a patient was coming to them and had an out of network policy and they were out of network, they wanted the out of network facility to, to say no for some reason. So what one of the things they came up with was if someone had an out of network policy and they went to an out of network facility, then the, when the, the insurance company was billed for the services, they would write the check directly to the, the patient, the member, not the facility actually providing the services. If you went to an in network facility, they would pay the facility directly. So they had tons of, of, I mean, at our facility, we had, uh, a, I was just, it was about $400,000 in AR that was on a rolling basis that was made up of checks that were paid to members for, for in, in those circumstances. And you get to the point where you, you don't really want to take them anymore. And so they end up hopefully, you know, 
putting getting up against uh, going into an in-network facility. Um, and, and I mean the 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 outcome of that was was dramatic because we had people relapsing that were you know three weeks out of treatment and they get a check for seventeen thousand dollars or six thousand dollars made out to them and they're three weeks out of treatment or they're in IOP. I mean it was a lot of people killed themselves on that. A lot of people died because of it. Uh, Jeff asked, how would you determine whether to go in network or not if you were opening tomorrow? Uh, so th that's a big one. That's, that's actually one of the things I'm glad you asked because I had planned on hitting it anyway. Um, it, it goes back to understanding your model. Um, if you were opening today, one of the things that's good to, important to know about in network is it no matter when you're looking at it, it's always good to be in business and have a track record for at least a couple of years. So it's very difficult to get good in-network rates or have good in-network relationships if you are just starting out. Um, but after about a year or two um, and you're tracking your outcomes, um, the time to do it really depends on, on pulling billing data on your out-of-network policies and t seeing the, the amounts that you're getting paid, the, the allowed amounts on your policies in your geographic area and what payment activity you're seeing. Then taking a look at your business model and understanding uh, how much more of a market you think you can capture based on going in network. Because or ordinarily, and this is a little dated, but it, it used to be something like 65 to 70% of the policies in the country on, a, on just an aggregate form were HMOs versus PPOs. So if you're completely out of network, you're fighting for only, you're limiting yourself to only you know 35% to 30% of the market of policies. Once you go in network, you open yourself up to 100% of the policies that are out there because you can take an HMO or a PPO. Um, so, Ordinarily, the benefits that you have to weigh, and, and you have to do this for yourself, is understand, one, uh, what your cost per acquisition would be when going after the out-of-network policies, because it's more expensive, versus in-network. Like, you know, my out-of-network policies, my cost per acquisition is, is, is let's say, $4,000. But my in-network policy, those campaigns have a cost per acquisition of $1,000. Okay. Then I look at how much I would I get paid on average for a patient stay out of network, and then compare that to what I can negotiate in network, what my rates will be. Um, there's a large benefit to, to going in network. You know exactly what you're gonna get paid, uh, or at least what the allowable is. Out of network, there could be, Blue Cross could, has something like 150 different plans. They all pay different amounts, so you have to, do a lot of, of analysis and, and waiting to figure out kind of what your average is. And it's tough to figure. Um, it's tough to relate back to your business model. But that's, uh, I know Dan and Gemp and, and, and uh, Greg Kellen did a, a presentation a few weeks ago on the importance of synchronizing your marketing and your billing data. And that's where the, one of the huge importances of doing that is if you have your billing provider, either your billing company or your in-house billing department, pulling reports and aggregating data and pulling it back to, um, to your campaign information and the costs that you're spending in marketing, that's how you're going to be able to make, to make some of those decisions. Uh, the people. Uh, speaking oh, of awesome. Dan, he actually has, is attending and has a question for you. Um, he says, I uh, you said it's all relative yeah. to the business model, but if I had to choose between in-network and out-of-network as a new treatment center operator, is one of them just flat out easier to be compensated from a billing perspective, where my center would be paid more consistently, all things being equal? Uh, yeah, I mean, gun to the head in-network, yeah, for sure. And, and, and the next step after it just in network is a Medicaid model. Medicaid models are, are the next step toward consistency and lower marketing costs. 
and full census. And we have caught up on questions, so. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I wanted to get into the, uh, and it, it goes along with all this, the kind of what I call like kind of like the, the golden formula to understanding the, the revenue to a, to a company, your, just your revenue and, and your, um, your quality of revenue. And that's, it's very simple, but the formula is how many days you're gonna get authorized at what level of care, and then how much you're gonna get paid per day uh, for each one of those. The problem that we have, like the reason that out-of-network facilities are so difficult to understand is from a revenue perspective uh, going forward is both things are dramatically moving targets. They don't wanna authorize the time um, every every year it seems that they're using uh, some other different strategy. So you you might have someone that um, I remember it was the uh, the um, it was Horizon in in New Jersey. They paid really well per day and they authorized a lot of time. And we thought we saw these Horizon policies and we were really excited because we thought we did really well in them. And one year they. At, at like the first January 1st, they changed something about how they looked at authorizations. And all of a sudden they still paid well, but the authorizations were just atrocious. So the, the plans that we thought, you know, were, were really good that we did well on all of a sudden we didn't do so great because part of that formula changed. It's one of the things that's nice about going in network is you take one of those moving targets and you nail it down. You know how much at least you're going to get paid. Um, so understanding what you actually get paid and what actually the, the plans allow for is super important. One of the biggest misunderstandings that I see people have is they try to understand what they get paid in order to understand how a policy is going to act in the future. So if you take your historic payment information on um, your Aetna plans and you take a look at what you actually got paid, then you try to use that information to evaluate if you should take what this Aetna plan that's being presented to you at admissions. The two aren't exactly the same because the plan that's coming to you today has a deductible, has coinsurance, has member responsibility. And so you may have, you may be looking at these historic payments and it looks like you're going to do very well on this plan. Or, but this policy that's being presented to you today is going to require $15,000 to, to be paid to it before it's going to give you dime one because it's deductible and coinsurance are so high. What you need to, to be understanding and tracking is the allowed amount. The allowed amount is a, a proprietary number on the side of the payer that they put on every single plan that is the maximum that it will pay. So how it works out is if you bill the, uh, let's say Aetna, you bill them for a day of residential and you bill them $4,000, they're not gonna pay you 80% uh, of bill charges or 70% of bill charges. It's not like that anymore. They have a dollar amount per day that let's say it's $900 for that day. And that's the allowed amount. That's the maximum it's going to pay. From there, you still may have the deductible to apply or coinsurance to apply so it doesn't mean you're gonna get paid that 900 if there's member responsibility, still outstanding. But that's the value, maximum value of the policy. It's the most important number to understand. If you understand that number, then you know how to evaluate any plan that you get going forward, coming in the door. So I've had uh, a lot of discussions with people that would say, you know, I get paid, you know, average of this much for PHP or this much for residential or this much for IOP. Uh, and I just know that they're wrong. I know they're looking at it maybe one time they got paid that or another time they got paid that. Uh, but the problem is they're, they're not really understanding the right data point to be tracking with these policies. Any other questions so far? Uh, Monique just mentioned that, you know, this caused so, so much damage to the patients. Truthfully, it causes so many relapses. 
Oh, it does. It's it's horrific. The uh, the the different ways that we that I've seen over the years of uh, and I, I used to think watching this activity, I used to think that the payers were trying to get the patient, uh, sorry, the facility to go in network to make it hard to to function out of network. I realized over time they're really trying to get the patient to divert to in-network by making out-of-network facilities say no or just go out of business. And that's really their, the drive is to make the patient go in-network. Um, there's also, when you're in-network, they're building in uh, incentives in the contracts um, where they actually allow for a, uh, an increase, a percentage increase to your rates if you meet certain standards for outcome measurements. Um, outcomes is something that still is not standardized. It's been a buzzword for a couple of years. Uh, everybody's talking about outcomes. I know there's software providers that claim that they have, you know, a built-in outcome measurement. Keep um, uh, who has their BAM assessment and uh, a bunch of other, other tools. And there, until there is, is parity and uniformity, an agreement on what should be tracked between payers, government bodies, like licensing bodies and providers. There, it, there isn't a lot of known value in, in tracking it because you could be tracking something that the payer then later says, okay, you're tracking these 12 things, that's cool. Uh, and you're, you're bringing it to me as, a, as if it's an expression of value. However, we came out with our white paper last month on what we want people to track, which is what we're going to hold you to. And none of your things are on here. We, turns out we don't care about the things that you, that you thought were important. So you've been tracking all this information really that's useless to a payer relation. Um, and it's, it's difficult to know. There's, there's a couple good resources uh, and I could probably mail out um, where Aetna and Blue Cross had done some um, some early programs on tracking. Um, it gets really complicated because if you wanna show that a certain service works, we're talking about multiple different levels of care, multiple different uh, objectives at each stage in the treatment process. So you can't just say, uh, what, what after someone finishes a 90 day stay, full continuum from detox to IOP or an OP, then, what do what do we track after that? Well, what if somebody only does detox? Well, there still are outcomes that are important to measure if someone just does detox, or if someone does detox in a residential and not PHP or ILP. You know, it, it's all relative to their specific treatment plan. Um, and the, yeah, Jeff asked, I hear a lot about data, how could I as a provider use data against to leverage in, against insurance companies. It's, it's exactly this, it's exactly this. Um, when you're talking about uh, reasons that you should have higher rates or reasons that you should be fighting for, reasons that you should have better authorizations, longer treatment stays, um, the, you can't display something to someone or prove something that you can't track and show, that you haven't collected. Um, in order to, to be able to make this argument to an insurance company that essentially you provide value to them, you're a net gain in value, that someone coming to, to your facility is going to cause their overall healthcare costs to go down over time and their quality of life to go up, you have to be able to, to show that. And in order to show that, you have to be able to track data points within your EMR to prove after treatment that things are doing doing better for them. Um, the, re, the, the way that they've, a lot of places have done this is through these, uh, a mixture of different uh, types of collecting data after treatment. So they have uh, assessments that are inside the software, uh, the EMR software that a lot of people use in their alumni program that'll send out uh, to the patient at certain intervals. And uh, the Joint Commission actually has, I think, a list of 27 or, th oh, EMR is electronic medical record. So that's your software that you're using to take all your documentation, all your notes while someone's in treatment. So inside that is all your, your assessments, all your clinical information, your group notes, 
Um, from there, that's where you would house a module where you would have forms that would go out to track the patient's progress and certain quality of life factors after treatment. So as the patient is, is uh, engaging in IOP and, and outpatient services and then done with treatment entirely, we need to be tracking their progress in the community and in their own recovery for several years after treatment. Um, there's a lot of different ways of, of looking at what's important, but we know a lot more now that, that uh, just abstinence at one year, abstinence at two years is not nearly enough because someone could be abstinent at one year, but they could have been not abstinent most of the year. They could still not have a job. They could still not be engaged in a support network. They could be um, not medication compliant with the medications they need to be on. Um, so it's it's a lot of those factors that that they like to see that what what really paints a picture of someone who is doing well, doing better, who's improving. And they want to see these things not only being done, but improving o in, over time. So some of the most important ones are those, um, are they medication compliant if they, and again, that's relative to their treatment, uh, their treatment program. If they have medications that they need to be on for blood pressure, for um, hypertension, for, for diabetes, you know, are they engaged in medication compliance? Um, are they medically stable? Are they taking care of themselves medically? Um, are they taking care of themselves psych uh, psych psychiatrically? Are they on um, anti-anxiety meds or mood stabilizers if that was part of their discharge plan? Um, are they employed? Um, you can measure the number of days that someone's employed you know, throughout the year uh, or in school. Again, it, it depends if they're younger, their plan was to go to school. Or are they engaged in, in classes and how are they doing? Um, all of those things have to be tracked within a software system. So I know software systems like Sunwave and Kipu, um, they have assessments like this and forms like this, where as a facility, you don't have to be calling everybody all the time. You don't have to be burdened with, with collecting all this information. It, it makes it quite, quite uh, a, a lot easier. Um, but by, by collecting that type of information after treatment, for as long as you can, if you can get five years of post-treatment, that's ideal. Uh, that allows you to come back to payers and show how you stack up and how they're doing. Um, there's a couple of treatment programs that I know um, have engaged in, and we're able to get a, a close conversation with the payer and get sit down at the table and they were the payer told them what they were looking for and what they wanted them to track and how they wanted to evaluate them. And so that, I mean, that's, that's a huge benefit because a lot of times it's hard to know what they're looking for. They just come out, came out and had that conversation with them. They started tracking it and it came out that after about a year and a half, they found that they were like, you know, 37% higher in all these standards than any of the people in their area. And they were able to get um, really, really favorable terms with the payers because of that. In fact, one payer, I know they have an agreement that it will authorize 30 days residential right off the bat without having to do concurrent reviews, which is really unheard of. So I want, I'm, I'm almost at the end here. I wanted to leave time for uh, questions and discussion if anybody has anything else. Feel free to put your questions in the chat. I'm also going to share the evaluation form. Again, if you uh, fill that out within seven days, you'll get a coupon code worth 10% off. Uh, Norma asks, is there a book they, that she could read to better understand all of this? Boy, um, I have to think about that. There's the, uh, the stuff that I have learned um, has really come out of experience. There's, um, I, I have to think about it. There's, there isn't one, one, uh, one source necessarily. Please write it again. Well, and uh, be, 
it's that's part of the problem. It's it's been a pretty wild industry so far. Um, it's it's been it's been so unregulated and and it's been so uh, loosely defined that it's it's been really really tough to piece all this together because there isn't there isn't a, a certain place. Well, to and also, to. Uh, BHAP has a series of webinars for uh, SUD treatment provider boot camp where some of them go into some of the more uh, business side of things. Uh, as well, so and I'm put. A, I'll put the link in the thing. Uh, Monique wants to know how did you how do you market your billing company, yeah. network events, or just word of mouth? Yeah, so our billing company, uh, it I did it just word of mouth. Really, I didn't do a lot of marketing because it started out um, where I, I had a lot of places that would that would ask uh, for billing services that either they were in a total nightmarish situation with their current billing company and things were screwed up and I I didn't really feel like taking on that amount of work um, or it, it um, somebody was just starting out and would come in and just want to deal with like urine cups and you know it there was a lot of a lot of messy stuff out there so I we stayed small um, my whole goal with the billing company was to build up uh, a, a, as much size as I could get of good providers so that I could look at data in a, in a, in a wider, uh, larger access to data to understand the payer activities. So I wasn't trying to be the biggest billing company in the world. I was trying to be big enough so that I understood the environment and had, had data to study. Victoria asks, sense. what are the most urgently needed industry regulations today that would impact th this confusion? Uh, I think one of the biggest things that we need is, uh, a, a unified declared standard of, of how to measure outcomes that is required for certification for someone to even go to a treatment center in the first place. Um, they should be standardized that across all payers, all licensing bodies uh, and, and all government agencies that there is a standardized definition and tracking mechanism and, and description and, of, of what outcomes are, what positive outcomes look like, um, what is, are the levels of acceptable versus unacceptable, and um, and how to track them, a tracking mechanism. It, it's, it's absurd that in an industry that is tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars and tens of millions of people affected every year in healthcare, in medicine, we don't, we don't track efficacy. We, we don't. And efficacy has no bearing on the provision of services. Um, I don't see any bigger fault to the system than that. Nina asks, what are ways to position yourself as a provider to get the best contracts with commercial payers? Um, it's, I mean, the best way to, to, to position, position yourself, what they look at mostly is um, time and services is, is one of them. They want to see that you've been in business a while, that you're that you're financially solvent and stable. They want to see that um, there is a need in your area that is not being satiated by other providers. So if there are, are uh, a bunch of other uh, in-network facilities, the more in-network facilities that are already in your area, the harder it's going to be for you to get rates. Because um, they look at the population that that seeks treatment in that geographic area per year, per month, per period of time, versus the number of in-network beds. And if they have enough, then they don't need to be motivated to to add more. Um, the next is your staff, your medical director, uh, and your your clinical staff. Their level of licensure. Um, if you have master's level therapists with LCSWs, LMHCs, LMFTs. Um, that's huge. And, uh, the other is tracking outcomes. Uh, you don't have to track outcomes perfectly. You don't have to know everything that they do. Um, I mean, I know I, I kind of talk on the other side of that coin is like, you could get, you could get to a point where you try to track a bunch of stuff that they don't care about and then present something that they just poo poo. That's possible, but you need to be tracking something. You need to be tracking some some basic quality of life factors after treatment, so you can show that what you do works. Monique, 
Monique asks, Most do you feeling. offer mentorship regarding contract pricing? And she clarifies not insurance contract slash potential client contracts. I put a link into BHAP's LinkedIn group. Uh, as you can see mm-hmm. on the screen, I also have your contact info as long as you're LinkedIn, but I figured you could speak on that. Yeah, yeah, I sure do. You can feel free to reach out to me uh, at any time after this. Uh, Thea asks, could you mention again some of the basic quality of life data, i.e. job in school, that should be tracked? Yeah, absolutely. Um, some, of the, and it, it's, some of it's a little tough, but um, they like to see uh, your engagement with a supportive network. And it doesn't mean just AA. It could be uh, Celebrate Recovery, Smart Recovery, but um, a, do you, are you engaged in regular attendance in a support network? Um, are you employed or in school? So be, basically productive member of society. Um, are you accessing preventative health care? Are you going to your annual physical? Are you going to, um, if you have high blood pressure, are you getting your blood pressure checked regularly? Uh, are you addressing your health care in, pro- in a proactive way? Uh, preventative medicine is what they'd like to see. On the inverse of that, are you not accessing preventable health care costs? Like, are you not showing up in the ER? Are you not showing up in urgent meds? Are, you, are they not seeing claims for chest x-rays because you continue smoking? Um, things like that. Uh, and they like to see you uh, just in general not accessing healthcare services that should be prevented or shouldn't, shouldn't happen. Um, emergency services, things like that. Um, some of these things, they track themselves. So, you know, it's hard for you as a facility to go and survey your patients. Did you go to the ER last week? You know, are you sure you didn't? Well, they're going to know if that patient went to the ER because they're going to see a claim for it. They'll see it. The ER is going to bill them for it. So some of these things, they track themselves. Some of these things you have to track. They're not going to know if the patient's engaged in a, a support network or if they're working or if they're in school. That's the pieces you have to find out and you have to provide. Also, uh, BHAP did a webinar back in 2010 that is free to view uh, with uh, Best Notes and uh Juniper Canyon Recovery Center for Women on establishing a culture of data driven decisions, which talks about, you know, outcomes, data and whatnot. I put the link in the chat. Awesome. Any other questions? We've got about 10 minutes left. (laughs) That's all I had. Well, while we're waiting (laughs) for any other questions to come in, I want to thank Peter Wallstrom for presenting today. Thanks as well to you for participating. A reminder that you will be receiving an email in the next business few business days that will have information on how to access any additional information about the webinar. This email will be coming from at behap.us, so make sure, make sure to keep your eyes out for it. It will also include Peter's contact info. We hope you join us for future webinars. Our next one is April 13th, Overcoming Stress and Anxiety. You can sign up for our various newsletters, which include emails specific to upcoming events, at our website, www.bhap.us. I'll give it a few more minutes before we conclude. What would you say, what would you say is your biggest piece of advice you're, you're asked for? Um, I get, I get asked, um, when and how to go in network, um, and how much certain policies pay in certain states, probably the most. And it's always, it's always, it always depends. I mean, any, it depends on your model. It depends on your goals. It depends on your, your growth strategy. It, it depends if you're trying to, to, grow six locations next year, or you're trying to just stay a mom and pop and pass this business along to your grandchildren. It always depends uh, because there's a million different ways to do this. Uh, And it's, it's pretty complicated. So um, every question requires an awful lot of digging first. You know, I, I consider myself uh, 
the, the skill set that I think I develop the most is is that of a diagnostician because it requires understanding, you know, the heart of the of the question and the problem bef- before just giving an answer because there's there's so much to this industry, there's so much to RCM. Uh, you can't. There's no such thing as saying, well, the time to go and network is this time, or the time to t- start taking Medicaid is then. Um, it well, it, it depends. Do you want to? Going to Medicaid, do you have, do you suffer with problems that that would solve? Would that help your business model? Uh, can you contain your costs to the extent that you can afford to do that? Um, you know, there, it's it would it's irresponsible to start like it's like rolling someone in the ER and just start cutting them open without asking them like what hurts. You know, you you, you have to understand the the problem with as much detail as, as possible before start starting to try to give advice to it. And then uh, COVID-19 has obviously changed the industry in, in several ways. How do you see uh, this affecting what's going to be happening in, say, the next two to three years? Well, one of the biggest things that has happened is since COVID is, has lasted as long as it is, as it has, people are starting to realize what, what they're capable of. They're, if COVID had just been three months, We would have gone right back to what we know, which is banging around in person, not doing anything remotely, not doing any telehealth, not pushing ourselves to do things differently. Now that it's lasted so long, out of necessity, people have realized that certain things aren't so bad. Certain things are really bad and have had to be worked around. Um, So the, the provision of mental health services telephonically has taken off dramatically. Um, and we found that, that, you know, it can be a low cost model to, to providing supportive, uh, therapeutic services for, for tons of people that can reach more people. Um, and it's being developed dramatically. Um, you know, some of the things that we learned in just in the business world through not just at, at treatment centers, that's tough because you have people that are there, you have to physically be there, but vendors, Billing companies, uh, marketing companies, um, all sorts of other companies are working completely remotely and they're seeing staff productivity go up, staff turnover go down. Um, you know, you, your HR is saying, well, I don't have half the, the squabbles that I used to have because nobody's in the office together anymore, you know, and, and that's a cost saving. So, you know, there there's a lot of things that we're learning that that are just happening because it's gone on for so long. Um, I think in our industry, it's it's gonna come down to, I think the payers are gonna make a shift for telemedicine, replacing IOP um, if it gets developed to, to uh, widely enough. Um, I hope that doesn't happen, but um, I mean, IOP still is such an essential service. But um, yeah, uh, that's, what I've seen. Now, Norma asks a question that I can kind of chime in on as well. She asks, is there a difference between the states? Now, BHAP, as, as I mentioned, is a national organization, uh, but yes, uh, state level, it, it, and for better or for worse, uh, each state kind of has their own regulations. Um, so I know uh, CCAP is a great resource for if you're California-based. We also have several connections in other states, uh, but if you want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, uh, I didn't know. Um, is what difference? I'm guessing is, in is like the there are difference in what between. In, I'm guessing in the the billing and regulations and on all the stuff that you've been talking about. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, there's so every state has its own licensing body. So it's the in Florida, it's the Department of Children and Family Services, um, and in other states, it's like their healthcare administration that is responsible for the licensing of the facilities, their state license. Those standards are very different state to state. Um, payers are often pretty consistent in their behavior state to state, but they differ in um, how, so p- payers often will contract with, with other organizations, behavioral health organizations to manage the behavioral health side of these benefits because they don't specialize in them. They don't really know what to do with them. Um, those organizations are, are state by state. Their standards change. So you'll see authorization activity, certification activity. It will be different state to state, even with the same payers. Uh, also, uh, accreditation is nationwide. 
So Joint Commission and uh, CARF are going to be the same um, nationwide. But Medicaid is different state by state. Medicaid's uh, very similar, but Medicaid does is a state agency. It's a state product. So uh, if you're a Medicaid provider, you're going to be very different state by state. Okay, see if there's any other questions. And I know that we are planning a, a webinar with the Joint Commission um, in, I want to say, June. Uh, it should be going up on our website in the next day or two. Uh, knock on wood. Wow. <laughs> as soon as I invent that 48 hour day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, got got several people that are uh, hoping you do actually write that book, so there's some incentive there for you. <laughs> <laughs> What's the uh, one thing that you uh, hope to accomplish? I mean, that you would like to change about the industry, or that you're trying to to get better at? Uh, what one thing that I've been I have been pretty involved with is I, I believe that our software solutions are grossly inadequate, that I think that that where we are, as far as our, our technological capabilities to have uh, contiguous systems that have smart reporting that are able to take billing data and bring it back into marketing data and, and drive business decision-making, um, I think that it's, it's years behind where it could be. Uh, it's something that I'm I'm pretty involved in and pretty dedicated to. I know like guys like Dan and and Greg and and Jeff who's on here. Um, there's they've all just heard me talk about it for years, but there there exists all this information that's being tracked somewhere, and it's normally getting tracked and dealt with in disparate systems. You have a marketing system that does marketing uh, and tracks that information consumer behavior online, purchase decisions, um, engagement, and then you have an EMR that, that tracks your clinical data, your diagnoses, your, your, your assessments, your group notes, your progress, and then you have a different system that does your billing and your claims management and claims submission collection. And all of the, There's a benefit to having all of that in the same system so it can all be looked at from, from a whole. It can be reported on and traced and tracked from one to the other so that you know the value of every decision that you're making and the impact of every decision. And right now uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's, or it's very difficult to do, or it's, it's the systems are either, you know, stitched together and not cohesive or they're, you know, not complete yet. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, of, I would love to make an impact in that. I think that would affect, the most lives, the fastest, because um, it's something that that is, is is so powerful and so scalable. Great. Well, thank you again for presenting. Thanks to everyone in the audience for attending. With that, yeah, thanks, it everyone. looks like we have no more questions. So with that, this concludes today's webinar. Thanks again.